We've sent, spent three weeks talking about what does it look like to unplug, to recognize that sometimes our lives start to look like a surge protector that has plug inside a plug and extended upon extender, and you, there's a point where you go, what's going on? And, and are there ways, we, we, we've talked about, are there ways to recognize that anxious worry needs to be unplugged from our lives, and we've got to plug into God's peace, and, and that, that constant busyness, being driven to go, 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 go. We say, man, when did I sign up for that? And I don't even remember saying yes to this. And we just start taking some of these things out of our lives and say, you know, man, is there more to life than just going and going and going? And today we're talking about how sometimes we get plugged into and, and technology, and technology gets plugged into us where all of a sudden, and I think over these last couple of years, for a lot of people during COVID, being at home more, just plugging in more to technology and, and watching this and this show and streaming this show. And I've got four different streaming services and I'm part, on this platform and that pl- platform for social media and, and I'm working at my computer and it's just like, man, how much can your brain take and how much is coming in? And so, so there, there's this sense that maybe we need to learn how to unplug from sort of the addictive nature of technology. And it can be very addictive. And plug into God's gifts, the cr- gifts of the creator, his beauty, his creation, all he's made for us. And I want to be clear as we begin uh, that this message I'm going to give to you, this message is not some kind of you know, pastoral diatribe or you know, argument against technology. I am not anti-technology. And some people say, oh you're, oh, you're one of those pastors, you just you hate technology, you say it's all bad and it's all evil. No, I'm not saying that at all. My dad is a, was a computer graphics designer and inventor. I remember my dad sitting at the dining room table after dinner and reading code off of cards. And then he worked for Hughes and Lockheed. He was part of an international group that developed computer graphic languages and systems. So we had a computer room in our home before there were home computers. And there's, there's, there's value to technology. If you were to come into my office here at Shoreline Church and see me working, you would see me sitting behind this desk. This is my desk. And so, and I normally, and I could, I could explain to you, I have my calendar, you know, top right, I've got my click up bottom right where I have my connection to myself and two assistants who do the work with me, then I have my calendar here, and, I, and I've got my, got my three email accounts here, and I've got my music over on the left there, and, and, I, and then I work with my current stuff on my computer, I have my iPad, you go, well, it doesn't seem like he hates technology. Well, that's what's at my desk here at the church. Now, if you went to my home office where I work in the evenings, you would see this. <laughs> go back to the work. There you go. Go back to home. That's my life. I'm plugged in. I love, so, I, so we can make that go away now, but I love technology. Yesterday, a young girl was lost in Marina, and they found her after five or six hours of searching, but it was technology connecting people together that allowed them to search for... Some of, the, some of you here were out looking late last night for this little girl that was lost. Those of you that are online right now, there's between 1,500 and 2,000 people who are part of worshiping with us right now online. And it's, it's technology. Right over here is a bank of screens and machines, and up in another room, Dale's up there, and he's running all this stuff, and we have cameras. You're going, well, the church doesn't seem anti-technology. We're not. But any good thing can be corrupted if we're not careful. Fire can heat your food or keep you warm. And fire can burn your house down and burn a forest down and burn a person down. Good things can go either way. And so we're not talking about technology as if it's inherently bad or evil. What we're saying is we need to understand the power of technology. And so, and so again, understand that for me personally and for showing as a church, we utilize technology for the glory of God. But we also understand the power of technology. And, and so, Lord Jesus, we pause right now and we pray that today as we dig into your word, we will recognize that we have, each of us have so much time to invest in life. And each of us have lives that we can live for you or for your followers. And Lord, we can leverage technology as a good gift or we can, if we're not careful, it can become something that can be so damaging and consume our lives. Would you give us wisdom and humble hearts to hear what you have to say to us today? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The question is not, is technology helpful at times? The question is, how much is enough and how much is too much? And what technology and what content the technology brings into our minds and our hearts and our lives. What content is fun and good, neutral, bad, or like wicked and nasty. And it's all out there. And it's all one or two clicks away. And a word to parents and grandparents today. That we need to be aware of and understand what the next generation, the generation after them, are being exposed to. If they're not aware and if we're not aware, they can head down some really dark roads. And so the first thing I want to think about is just our time. 
Your time is precious, so use it well. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul addresses this topic, that you, each of us has 24 hours in a day. How do we use the days that God has given to us? We don't know how many days we have, but each day, 24 hours. How do we use that time? Ephesians 5.15 says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. I love those words, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. That language doesn't mean every day is evil. It means there's plenty of evil that can happen each day if we don't use our time well. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What is God's will for you for today? I believe it's his will that you're here right now worshiping him. But what are you going to be doing two hours from now and eight hours from now? How do you use your time? If you're a follower of Jesus, you say, Lord, what's your will? How would you have me use the time you've given me, this one day I have to live for you? And so we can understand that we can use time well. We can bless others. We can connect with God's will. We, we, can, we can do things that are wonderful. And yet, our schedule and our time get filled up when we get addicted to technology. When, when technology begins to consume us. When we sit down to watch a show and all of a sudden six hours have gone by. And we go, how'd that happen? I mean, I sat down right after dinner and it's midnight. Well, some really creative people fed you show after show after show after show. What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? Binge watching wasn't even a term a few years back. And it wasn't a positive term when it first came out. But now, now so, so technology has this kind of power. We have to be careful. So, so I did a little study to get a sense of what's happening in our culture when it comes to media, when it comes to technology and, and what we're watching, viewing, playing. So the average American consumes about, now get this, average American consumes about five and a half hours every day, five and a half hours of traditional media, entertainment, shows, gaming, just different kinds of media, and two and a half hours of social media. If I do my math right, that sounds like about eight hours of input. That's the average American, which means some people are engaged more than that. And some of you go, well, how can that be so high? And some of you go, how can that be so low? <laughs> it just depends on how much you consume media. But technology brings, I mean, we, we carry a powerful tool in our pocket or in our purse in a phone that can stream show after show after show after show or media content or social media. And then the average teen in America spends more than nine hours of screen time daily. Seven of those hours are on entertainment. So the, uh, the average American young person, sp teenager, spends that much time just consuming media. So that's a time issue, but also you have to say, well, what, what's in the content? What is it that we are consuming? And so a big thing I want you to hear today, and, and I think this will be one of the most important things, is to recognize that you can choose how much you're going to use technology. All these devices have buttons that you can actually turn them off for an hour, for a day, for a week. They do. But you get to decide how much media and how much consuming technology is going to impact you. I had a very profound moment about 30 years ago in my life. 30 years ago. Now, this is before there was lots of the media there is now, but there was still plenty of media back then. And I, and I was really into watching sports. I, I could... I could I, can get pulled into any sport, watching any sport. I love sports. So about 30 years ago, I had an opportunity. I had a publishing company that said, we'd like you to do some writing for us. And that writing had to happen outside my regular church work time because it wasn't my church work. It was just writing for this publisher. And they wanted about 20 hours a week of writing. I looked at my life and I said, I don't have 20 hours a week. I don't have the time. But then I slowed down and I dug deeper. And I said, okay, how much time do I spend every week sitting in front of the TV, consuming media? And I figured out I spent about 20 hours a week watching sports. So I had to decide, okay, I have 20 hours a week watching sports and they want me to consider writing for 20 hours a week. And I made a decision to cold turkey stop following sports and give that time to writing. At the end of that year, I had spent about 1,020 hours writing. And to this day today, I've spent about 32,000 hours writing. Now, I don't know who won any big sporting event last year. But I do know that one study that Sherry and I wrote together on community has been used by over 400,000 Christians around the world, and it's in Portuguese, Spanish, German, Mandarin Chinese, English, 
And would I trade the 32,000 hours and say, I would have rather have spent the last 30 years watching sports 20 hours a week and have 32,000 hours in that or this. I, I feel like I made the right choice for me. And you might say, well, I don't have anybody asking me to write for them. Fine. But you have kids that need you to spend time with them. You have grandkids you can focus on. You have neighbors that need time. You're part of a church that is built on the gifts and the time and the energy of volunteers serving. Right now, the people that are watching your children and leading our youth ministry, there's a couple of paid people. It's mostly volunteers. There's things you can do with your life. You have to make a decision. And today, I, I started my work day this morning at 6 o'clock. After the service is done here, I'm going to be part of the Alpha Luncheon there. And when that's done, I'll go home. Sure, I'll have something to eat. And I'll put in four to six hours of writing time today. And you know what? That's part of God's call on my life. Because I grappled with this question, God, how do you want me to use my time? And the first week I did that, it was 20 hours. 30 years later, it's a lot of time. And can I tell you, by God's grace, Sherry and I together, we've written, I think, 12 books, over 130 published small group study guides, and over 300 articles. I choose that over telling you who won this or that sporting event. You have to look at your life and say, how am I using my time? And can I use it in some other way? And I believe if you pray and ask the Lord, he will guide you. And then beyond just the time, also what we put into our brains, what we put into our minds matters. And so your mind matters and purity honors God. See, some of the stuff that technology brings to us is neutral. Some of it is wonderful and great. Some of it's funny and entertaining. But some of it is dark. And this is one of the things that we want you to understand. If you're a parent or grandparent, when the service is over, go out to the courtyard and there's a booth there. We have all kinds of materials. All these, we just have a bunch of different materials to help you know how to walk with your kids and your grandkids through technology to talk about things, to see how they're using it. And if you're online, all these resources are online on the front of the webpage, just says Sunday resources, and click on that and it'll open all these up for you. But we want to share those with you. And again, I encourage you, if you're a parent or grandparent, to go talk with our team at the booth after the service and just say, man, I'd like to have some insight. Because you, you may not recognize the darkness of what's out there. As much as there's good, fun stuff, online and through technology, there's also some very dark stuff. So here's some information for you. Every day, every day, about 2.5 billion emails containing pornography are sent and received. Every day, 2.5 billion emails. There's 68 million searches every day related to pornography. 25% of the total search, online searches every day are por pornographically related. That's part of our world, globally. Online pornography affects all kinds of people, but here in America, they've studied this. There's about 200,000 Americans who are classi classified as pornography addicts. They're addicted. They can't control themselves. About 40 million Americans regularly visit porn sites. And interestingly, about a third of those are women. You might just think, well, that's a male problem. No, it's a people problem. It's an all of us problem. And third, listen to this, 34% of internet users have experienced unwanted exposure to pornography. 34% of people that use the internet would say, I wasn't looking for it, I didn't click for it, I didn't ask for it, but somebody sent me something. And there's people out there trying to create ways of getting stuff to you and to your kids that you don't want and you try to block. There's a battle going on there. And so just, you need to be aware of that and acknowledge that. Internet pornography damages teens massively. The it, internet pornography increases the odds of teenage pregnancy. Young people that are involved in pornography get pregnant much, much more quickly. Uh, it raises the risk of depression and severe depression. Online stuff and cons consuming this stuff can bring great depression for young people. It also it disorients the expectations of young people. What they expect when they get married someday, if they have a future, their whole worldview begins to change if they're immersed in pornography. And pornography affects marriages and families. Listen to this stat. This, this is amazing. 47% of families in the United States report that pornography is a problem in their home. Almost half the homes in America would say one child or one spouse or somebody or more are, are, have a problem with that and it, and it affects their home life. Pornography use increases marital infidelity by 300%. The chance of having an affair increases by 300% if you get involved in pornography. When people say, well, these are victimless, you know, victimless things. It doesn't affect anybody. It affects everybody. It affects you and then the people around you. 40% of people identified as sex addicts lose their spouses. 58% suffer from financial loss and 33% lose their job. It is powerful. It is, and in 68% of divorce cases in America, 
involve one person meeting someone else online or reconnecting with somebody online. There's a lot involved here. And so, Lord, we pause again in the middle of this message. Lord, we're not done looking at your word. We're not done thinking about this. We just pause. And we pray for those people who are dealing with this kind of an addiction, this kind of enticement. We pray for young people that are being fed lies about their sexuality, about who they are, about what what is right and natural and honoring to you. And we pray that you would be with this next generation, the generation after it, being born into a world where all these things are as close as one or two clicks. And we pray that you would help us understand what it means to pursue you and to look at our hearts and our minds and pursue that which is holy and good and right. And Lord, this world brings so many temptations. May May we recognize them, battle against them, and live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So a question. What steps can I take to unplug from addictive technology? Are there steps I can take to start to unplug some of these things? Say, man, during COVID these last couple of years, I've gotten too plugged in. Or maybe just life in general. Or maybe I'm I'm spending so much time gaming or watching or viewing or a part of this. And if you took my phone away for an hour, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. I'd start to tremble. I'd be like, but my friends need me and I have to be able to respond. You know, what, if you look at how do I start to unplug? Here's some ideas. One is this, limit my options. You can cancel some things, put filters on some things, but, but limit your options. Say there's certain things that I'm just not gonna do. If you, if you go, well, I got five different streaming services for movies. That might be enough movies. That might be too many movies. You might say, I'm gonna choose to cut back from that. Some of you have tried this and, it, and most people I talk to, when they start cutting back and limiting their options, they go, it's my life so much better because I'm finding other things to do with my time and my life. Limit my time and the time of my family members. Limit how much time you spend engaging in social media, in traditional media, in gaming, in watching shows, and, and I read a book some, uh, some years ago called Deep Work. And uh, the writer of the, the, the book actually has two PhDs from MIT in neuroscience. And he's a br- brilliant, brilliant guy. And in this book, he talked about how he says, in my family, we turn off all technology at 6 o'clock in the evening. TV, technology, everything goes off. Our phones, everything goes off. 6 o'clock. And we just share time together. This is a guy who's studying these things. And, and do you want to know who doesn't let their kids and grandkids use very much technology? The people who invent it. Do some study on that. The people who are creating a lot of these things would say, my kids are going to a school where they can't use, they're using like paper and pencil and not technology because they understand the potential addictiveness of this. But look and say, you know, I'm going to limit the time. Now, what if you say, well, say to your kids, we're going to limit the time that we are using our devices. And they say to you, you can't do that to me. I'm a free American. You can't tell me what to do. I was trying to think about this, these these. I've seen this, I've seen it like in shows. I don't know if this is a real thing, but it could be. But like kids would say to their parent, you can't come into my room. This is my private space. You don't have permission to come into my room. I was just trying to think of what my dad would have done to me <laughs> when, when I was like 12. If I just said, dad, this is my personal space. You can't come in here without knocking, knocking and asking my permission. I'm not even gonna break down how that would have gone, but I'm just gonna say it would not have gone well <laughs> for me. But, but there's this idea now that, well, parents, you don't have any right to put parameters on your children. That's not true. As a matter of fact, you have an obligation and a responsibility before God Almighty to love your kids enough. And they say, grandparents, if you can influence your grandkids, you have to be in concert with your kids. You can't overrun your kids. But if you're, you and your kids are together, it helps to see the family thinking about those sorts of things. So you can limit the amount of time. That's allowed. That's good. You can do that for yourself. You can make choices that edify and lead to holiness. Is what I'm watching, what I'm viewing, what I'm doing, the game I'm playing, is this neutral and just kind of fun? Is this positive? There's stuff out there that's very positive. Or is this negative and harmful? Or dark and demonic? And again, I'm not against technology. But there is, there is stuff out there that's getting piped in that is so dangerous and so dark. And if you as a parent aren't aware of what your kids are involved in online, you need to get aware. And we got some, again, some tools for that are out in the courtyard. And talk with Greg, talk with Brandon, talk with Tom. We got a team out there to answer questions for you. And if we need to go a little deeper with you, we'll get your name and information. We'll just connect someone with you one-on-one. We want to walk with you and help you think through these things. And then to create accountability. A way you can limit stuff is just by creating accountability. You can put on accountability programs on your devices for yourself or for your kids, or you can have somebody else you just talk to that's keeping you accountable to make good choices and wise choices in in what you view and what you do. But, but to create an environment where there's accountability over, over what, you're, what you're viewing, what you're doing, how you're using your time. 
and then plug into other things that bring more joy, more peace, and more life. There are better things that we can plug into, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But again, we've got great resources outdoors for you. And then as we're unplugging, as we're limiting ourselves, as we're limiting our time, as we're choosing the content that's appropriate for us, I gotta tell you, one of our pastors here is a tech, kind of a techie guy. And I was, asked, I was talking about this this last week. He goes, oh, it's not a problem with my kids' phones because my kids' phones shut off at like a certain time every night. They just shut off. They can't turn it back on because he set up something on their phone that makes it shut off. <laughs> and they also can't go to these kind of sites because I set up stuff on their phone where they can't go to those kinds of sites. He says, so it's not a dangerous tool in their hands because I block them from a bunch of stuff that's potentially dangerous. Yes, that's possible. Some of the young, young people are going, don't figure out how to do that. But, but again, if you love your kids, if you care about yourself, you can limit yourself. You can create accountability with your spouse. So you're not looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at or with friends. But, but again, make those decisions. And then as, as we unplug those things, we need to plug ourselves in to things that are life-giving and good and beautiful. And so listen to these words. We got to plug into your creator's good gifts. God has given you gifts that we've been missing probably the last couple of years because we've been locked up in our homes and limited and probably spending way too much time watching shows and doing And we got to maybe say, I got to get back to a normal kind of life here. So listen to these words from Psalm chapter eight about God's good gift of creation. Psalm 8, 1. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, all that God has made, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them, human beings that you care for them, yet you have made them little, a little lower than the angels? You've crowned them with glory and honor. That's talking about you and other people. You've, you've, you've crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all the flocks and the herds, the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swims the path of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We've got to plug into the beauty of creation and the artwork of the creator. We live in one of the most beautiful places on the planet. I was talking to a woman this last week who said, on a normal day, I don't know if it's raining or clear out. I don't go outside. I don't look outside. She just has kind of been, been just living in. And that's how it's been for a lot of people the last couple of years. People are starting to kind of peek out. And a lot of people are just fine, but other people are just slowly kind of, you know, moving outward. But you know what? When's the last time people go, oh, it's so great here. We're right near the ocean. Oh, it's what a gift. You know, when's the last time you went down to the ocean? For some of you, it's five or 10 minutes from your house. 20, 25 at the most for most of you. When's the last time you went to the ocean, took your shoes off, and walked down the coast, feeling the sand between your toes, letting the water kind of wash up on your feet? Some of you go, it's been years. But there's God's creation. It's so powerful, so beautiful. We had a pastor in town a couple weeks ago that was just shadowing some of our staff and learning about some things we do at Shoreline. And I said to him, hey, we're going to spend about an hour processing some different things we've been learning about, but let's just do it down by the beach. So we went down there, and, he, and we went down to go on the beach. He goes, can I take my shoes off? I said, you don't have to ask permission. So he said, we're walking along the beach. We're walking along right along the water's edge, and he's looking at when the, when the waves come in and they wash back, all these little, like, V kind of lines are the lines in the water as it's pulling back. He goes, what are, what are all those? I said, those are actually little, uh, little uh, crabs or bugs under the water. And he goes, no, they're not. And I said, oh, I said watch. And I went down, I got on my knees, I took a big two handful. Of, I grew up on the beach, so I took a you know, scoop down, and I just took it, and I just threw it along the sand, the wet sand. And there's like 40 of these little, little round, and they all, they all like, ah, and then they start crawling, and, you know, going back under the water. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? And he, he was like, no way, do that again. And I was like, it's magic, you know, it's, no, it's just crabs. Um, but, but just hanging out, he, he lives in Michigan. He doesn't have the ocean there, but we do. We got hills and hikes around here that are just beautiful. And by the way, when you go take a walk on the ocean, you go take a walk on the hills, turn your phone off and leave it in your car or leave it at home. And some of you go, oh no. <laughs> I mean, I'm really important. People have to reach me any moment all the time. <laughs> Do you want know on a timeline of human history, on a timeline of human history, you know how much you would fill with we've had phones in our pocket everywhere we go? It'd be so tiny you couldn't even see it on the timeline of human history. People used to go to the beach and take walks without a phone. How many of you can remember a time when you couldn't because the cord on your phone wasn't long enough, right? I mean, it's like, 
And, and, and so just say, can, can I go out? Can I connect in God's goodness? And then Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 19, 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Because the heavens declare the glory of God. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and it makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. There's something so beautiful about just being in God's creation. I remember when our boys were younger and they, were growing, they grew up in Michigan, West Michigan, the winter would get really cloudy where we lived for like a month, month and a half. You couldn't really, wouldn't see the sun. But when the sun would break through on a cold winter day, we had this big kind of sliding window that went out to the backyard. And when the sun came out and it would hit and go in that window, it would leave like a, like a square or a kind of a trapezoid of sunlight on the carpet inside of our house. And one of our sons, one of our sons would go and he would just lay and stretch out in the sun and just like, like vitamin D, vitamin D, vitamin D. It's like just soak in the sun. It was like a cat just kind of laying there. But every time that, that, that patch of sunlight would come there, he would just go and drink it in. When's the last time you just drank in the beauty of, the, of, of a dark night with just pierced by the stars or the beauty of the, the coastal area we have here or the beauty of the Salinas Valley or the Toro Hills and just say, God, you're so good. This is so beautiful. So here's a question. What are some of the gifts God has given us that we can miss when we're locked into technology, when we're, when we're here, you know, just constantly here and we're constantly plugged in? What are some of the things we miss? Well, how about this? Face-to-face -face conversation. Like, like looking at another human being and talking and looking at their eyes and seeing their face, not just sending a, a note, but like talking to another human being. We had a great chat the other day, Martin. Just, 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 just talking about life and Martin showed me around his office and different family things and pictures and just, just like, just like, it was really weird. It was like one human being talking to another human being. It's like, that's allowed. That's a good thing. That's the way it used to be. Reclaiming some of that, connecting and talking with people. Fresh air. You know, breathing air outdoors and drinking it in. Facing people in a group, facing each other instead of facing all the same direction. We'll so oftentimes sit somewhere and we'll be sitting in chairs and couches like this. We're all looking at the same monitor together. And then you go, kind of like, whoa, there's a person right next to me. It's like we can just be zoned in here. And, and just think, how do, what about being together as a group and talking to each other? Physical activity, we miss it. We become inactive. Creativity, the arts. The beauty of the arts. One of, one of our pastors was just talking about one of his daughters. Their dance stuff is going kind of back at full swing again. And I just know for his daughter, that's like life for her to be back dancing again. And it's not, not a video game. It's not video dancing. It's just like with her own body, with other people dancing and learning to put on recitals, just to, to reclaim some of those things. Those are things we might miss if we just stay locked in to the world of technology. And again, there's so much good there, but we can't let it take over and rule our lives. And then plugging into creation. Some simple ideas. And let me give you a couple, just a couple fun little ideas that you might do in the next week just to see, see what it's like to kind of... And all of these, I would say, turn off your phone, don't bring it with you. And some of you get so anxious. You're like, but if I don't have my phone with me for like an hour, what if someone tries to reach out to me and they can't reach me? And then you say to yourself like this. You say, this is a simple little thing. You say, I'm not that important. <laughs> right? The world will go on without me. Because for most of human history, when someone was out taking a walk alone or with a couple of friends, nobody could reach them. That wasn't the thing. And most of the stuff we have to respond to will still be there when we turn, pick our phone back up again. It'll still be, you can pick it back up there. Try it. Some of you will create anxiety at first, but then you'll go, man, this was nice. And you might start occasionally like go somewhere and actually not remember to have your phone with you. It's like, oh, that can happen. You start to change how you see it. So here's some ideas. Take a slow walk on your own or with friends without technology and just notice, look around and see what you see. Thanking God for it. Get some good food, some good you know, fresh produce, something, something that God made. And just eat it and taste the flavors and say, God, thank you for this. Get together with some friends late at night and go somewhere where there's not a lot of light. Bring some blankets, lay out, and just look at the stars and talk about what God's made. Man, around here, when it gets, when it gets really dark and you can look up and see, well, it's, it's just astounding. Look, oh, did you see that one? There's a... 
I didn't see it. Okay, I was over there. And you just, and just talk together. Take some time outdoors and listen to hear things like birds. Birds are these little creatures with wings that fly around, and they're really cute, and there's all different sorts of them, right? But actually, see, when we, when we go everywhere plugged in, having earbuds in all the time, we don't hear some of the sounds that God has made that are beautiful, that God has his own music to, to bring to us. And so listen. Um, go outdoors <coughs> and exercise. Uh, ride a bike. Uh, take a long hike. Take, take a jog. And again, even if you're used to plugging into music, and I, and I, I love that kind of stuff, but just say, so I'm going to do that without any technology and just see what happens. And then plugging into the pinnacle of creation, the top thing. Do you know that in all of God's creation, the absolute best in God's mind, the best of what he made is you. It's people. In Genesis, it says that God created in his own image, male and female, he created them. And he said, this is very good. The best thing that you can enjoy in life and the thing that gets missed so often if we're consumed by technology is the people around us and the gift that God's given to us. There's too many parents that don't know their own kids because they don't talk. We actually made discussion questions for kids, teens, and adults. A whole bunch of, whole bunch of discussions, they're out at the booth and they're online also. You say, well, why would I need why would I need discussion questions? Well, if you just go, man, I want to just go deeper. I had, I had a young guy today, a, a DLI student, a language student at Events Language Institute, came up to me and he said, okay, I'm trying out some of these discussion questions. You ready for one? I thought it was wonderful. It's like his third time here at Shoreline. He sees me, he says, I'm going to try, can I try? And he says, here's the question. What's the silliest fear you've ever had? And I thought about it, and I told him. I'm not going to tell you because you didn't ask me. But, but, we had, but we had a great, I had this great conversation with this young language student who's part of our military, who's learning, uh, in his case, I think he was, he was learning um, Farsi, uh, and, but he started the conversation by using one of those questions on that sheet. Go pick up one of those sheets, or go online and download it. Talk to people, interact with people, have conversations, play board games, not, not technical games, not electronic games, those are, those are fine, but just go get a board game, or you, you probably have a whole stack of them somewhere collecting dust, but get out a board game, just play a game together. And take a walk with friends, but again, leave the phones at home, leave the technology in the car. Have a, have a great meal together with friends, but everyone agrees to leave the phones away. Have you ever watched a family around a table in a restaurant where each of the kids has their own device and the parents have phones next to them and at the end of the meal you just wonder, why? What's the, where's the human connection? But that's, that's, that's becoming our world, listen to this, by default, not intentionally. Nobody says, I want to have a meal and have nobody in my family interact. Nobody says that. Nobody wants that. It just starts to happen if we don't notice. So my prayer is that this, this message and these scriptures will kind of enliven your heart to recognize that your life doesn't have to be that way. Finally, our God offers peace, but we need to accept the offer. From anxious worry to confident peace, God offers it. Will you take hold of his peace? From a busy schedule where you run, 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 to say, no, I want to punctuate my day, my weeks with Sabbath rest. Will you receive that gift or will you say, no, thanks, God? From addiction to technology and having it just take over our schedules to using it for good things, but putting limits on it and finding the joy of creation and people and God's good gifts. It's up to us to make a decision about how we're going to live our lives. You have one day to live today, 24 hours. How will you invest that? Will you do it in a way that honors God, that brings joy to you, that deepens your relationships? That's the heart of God. Jesus, this is our prayer today. That as we think about our lives, each one of us, it's really tough to have somebody else try to tell us how to handle our time and how to, how to use our technology. But Lord, I pray for each one of us that calls you Savior and Lord, that loves you, Jesus. And each of us that loves our kids and our grandkids, that we would pay attention to these things, that we would, we would watch the stuff that's pouring into our lives through technology. Lord, may we leverage every good aspect of technology and use it for your church and for our lives and for our families and to, to find a lost little girl in Marina. And Lord, so many good things. We thank you for those gifts. But Lord, may we recognize the addictive nature and how much time it can take from us. And may we also recognize the kind of content that can come filling our hearts and our minds. And in your power, Lord, give us wisdom and strength 
to live for you in every part of our lives, including how we interact with technology. We pray this for Jesus' sake and for our sake. And we pray this in the power of Jesus' name. And if you agree, say amen. 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 Before I ask you to stand, I want to give you a couple invitations. And then we're going to stand so I can send you off with a closing blessing. First of all, this Wednesday is the best Wednesday of the month. It is the best Wednesday of the month because it is night of worship. 6.15 right here. We're going to have the big baptism tank set up. We're doing baptisms. We're doing communion. Uh, we have great music planned. I'm going to be opening and preaching from the, the parables. It's going to be a great night of worship. So 6.15 this Wednesday night. Join us here for night of worship. And also in the courtyard, we've got booths for Alpha. And again, 1 o'clock today, if you want to jump into the Alpha and learn more about that, we've got a gathering in the, in the Parkside room. We've got information about Bible studies, all kinds of things out there. Uh, te- the technology booth is set up there. So check out what's in the, the uh, outdoors there. And if you're online and with us still, go online to the front page and you'll find all those resources available for you electronically there. If you need prayer and you're on campus, please come in, and we'll have people on both sides of the front here ready to pray for you, loving to pray for you. And if you're online, just call the number you see, and someone will pick up the phone and pray with you, or you can email those prayer needs to the email address you see, and we'll, we'll put those on the prayer list. And if you're new at Shoreline, if you're anywhere on campus, outdoors, indoors, on campus, and you're new, before you leave, just pop by the Connection Center right there in the lobby. They want to give you a little gift bag. Thank you for coming. Answer your questions. and just give you a warm, personal welcome. And if you're online, all you have to do is just text the word welcome to the phone number you see there. Technology, right there. They're texting, right? It's good. It's fine. We're good. We're just not going to take over our lives. Amen? And so you can use that and just text that word, and we will reach out to you and give you a warm, personal welcome. If you're at home, outdoors, or indoors, would you stand with me and let me send you off with a word of blessing? And it's so good seeing many of you that are, that are starting to come back to church. Every week I see new people that are kind of back for the first time. It's great to be together. As you go from this place, as you finish your time online, may you recognize the face of Jesus who longs to give you rest and longs to give you peace and longs to see you use your time in ways that will honor him and bless you. So walk in the power of Jesus. Let the Spirit search your heart and your life and live in ways that fill you with his peace and overflow his peace everywhere you go. God bless you. Have a great next couple days, and we'll see you back here or online Wednesday night at 6.15. God bless you.